Hello, I'm Harry Riley. Welcome to Harry's 10 Minute Tales. This story is called Captain X the Second Goes West by Harry Riley. This story is fiction and resemblance to anyone, living or dead, is coincidental. Young Benedict Cornblay and his pal Joseph were creaking about in the loft of the ancient farmhouse during summer school holidays, helping Quentin, that's Benedict's dad, to sort out and throw away unwanted items of junk prior to moving day. Uh, steady Ben, let me move that heavy box. Quentin reached over his son and grabbing the large plywood packing case, he positioned it back on the, on the floor right under the bright extension lamp that is secured to the overhead roof beams. Within minutes both lads were rummaging through the case's contents with a will, hoping to find something exciting. Uh, hey, what do you make of this? asked Joseph. As he pulled out a wooden box of about a foot square with a top inch lid, Inside what, what was what appeared to be a very antiquated, strange brass contraption, mounted on a metal plinth. There was a vertical metal cylinder at the base, beautifully enamelled, with strange hieroglyphs inscribed on it. A hinged side flap, and inside this was a sort of wick coming out of a reservoir. Protruding at right angles from the centre of the cylinder was a brass box with vertical slots in the top, and a series of adjustable lens at the end. Out of the top of the cylinder came a small chimney. Quentin peered at it and explained, exclaimed, this was the old magic lantern he used to love as a kid. He said there should be several boxes of slides at the bottom of the packing case. The boys were interested in this and begged Quentin to make it work for them. About an hour or so later in a spare room at the back of the house, the youngsters waited in joyous anticipation as Quentin made final adjustments to the apparatus light, staring at a wall from which hung a big white blanket. Quentin switched on the small powerful torch he'd rigged up to provide alternative backlighting to the naked flame and inserted the first of the sandwiched glass slides. Reading from a companion manuscript to the slideshow he explained they would be they would be visiting a tour of the American Wild West as undertook in the mid 1860s by a certain captain Xavier Cornblack the second named after a witch finder working for Oliver Cromwell. Uh, one of our famous ancestors, explained uh, Quentin to a puzzled Joseph. In a low monotone voice, rather like mine, Ben's father continued to read from the written document in his hand. After his involvement in putting down the sepoy mutiny in India, during which he won a medal for conspicuous gallantry, our Captain X was wounded in the left eye and invalided out of the army. After recovery, though, he still craved adventure and sailed to America along with Ambrose Dexter, an artist and photographer friend, who was to capture any points of special interest along the way. He stayed there for several years, met and married a young Native American girl with an unpronounceable name who, for some reason, though he didn't quite understand, Captain X called Adele, and they travelled extensively through the Western Badlands. The Indian girl was brutally gunned down one day in front of him in a wanton act of violence by a band of robbers and he made it his life's task to hunt them down. This took him across several states and into Wichita, Wyoming, where he was greeted with some hilarity for his strange garb. He was allowed to keep his antique pistol by the local marshal who regarded it as merely a toy. In any case, a man with a leather patch over one eye was considered no danger by the hardened gunslingers of the district. Throughout this time he wore his distinctive Indian Army uniform of the Bengal Lancers, complete with sword and lance of flintlock pistol. He was friendly with the Earp family and even got to handle the famous bookline special with its long barrel. He recognised one of the gang who had killed his wife and sought him out in a duel. The Earp brothers tried to stop him, but he insisted it was a matter of honour and so at noon, on a very bright day, he stood in the main street to put his courage to the test. Everyone came out to witness his amazing folly against a known killer with a modern Colt revolver. But there were sharp gasps when he slowly pulled down his eye patch to reveal the strangest sight they'd ever seen. In place of the missing eye and fitting the socket like a glove was a dazzlingly iridescent sparkling diamond. Its multifaceted cuts were mirrored a thousandfold by the sun's rays. His enemy rubbed his own eyes to obscure the intense glare and panicked firing wildly in rapid succession whilst Xavier was patiently loading his flintlock. And then he calmly took aim, 
killing the man instantly with a shot through his forehead. The man went down as if poleaxed. This deal, deed was recorded in the Wichita Beacon, and he became an overnight celebrity. The glass slides were a new invention, using real photographic techniques, and the photographer artist recorded the gunfight on them, including getting the actual flash as the captain's gun went off, with his face to the sun and his diamond eye scattering brilliant shards of light all over the place. Colour was added later to the sepia prints, by a special etching method, but no matter how hard Ambrose tried, he failed to erase the ghostly image of a slender girl in a long white dress, standing just behind and to the right of Captain X. In this darkened room, in modern times, in a single, uh, simple English farmhouse by the coast, on a kitchen table, and perched still further above, by the aid of a wooden stool, stood the magic lantern. Its concentrated beam of light, containing a myriad of dust particles, projecting six feet across to the blanket on the far wall, transfixed and transported the young audience across the Pacific Ocean and back in time, as Quentin dropped in the slides in quick succession. The slides were wonderful, with the image on the blanket appearing as a three-foot oval in translucent colour, almost pastel tints, but of a slightly more intense hue. First there was the disembarking from the clipper at the docks, all hustle and bustle, and then there was the captain shaking hands with Abraham Lincoln at a US Army event. Another slide showed him exchanging swords with an unknown US officer. A third had him sharing a joke with William Cody, Buffalo Bill. And then they were in Wichita, swapping pistols with the Earp brothers, and Wyatt shaking his head as he examined the Lancer rifle, barrelled flintlock. As Captain X, wearing a wide-brimmed Stetson hat, pointed the Buntline special up at the sky. There were glorious scenes of Monument Valley, and of Indian braves and chiefs, all in their war paint and feathered headgear. Rail railroads were cutting a sway through the dusty plains and mountains as they crisscrossed state boundaries. The captain passed through Dodge and Tombstone, Arizona, and Deadwood with its crusty gold miners, and in every single one of these slides, and just to one side of the main scene, waited the ghostly apparition of the slender girl in the long white dress. Quentin then explained that the original Captain Xavier Cornblack had killed a girl called Adeline as a witch, and the story goes that her ghost had eventually risen up and had lured him to his death over the nearby cliffs. And maybe, maybe this Indian girl, the Captain Xavier II had called Adele, was perpetuating the myth. The captain finally died in his bed, back home, in that very same farmhouse.